Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nucleus Investment Insights. This week's episode is called US Tech, The Magnificent Seven. Almost all of the profit growth and share price appreciation in the US market this year has come from a small group of US tech stocks. These stocks are Apple, Microsoft, Meta, Alphabet, Tesla, Amazon, and Nvidia. We will investigate these stocks and see if their price appreciation is likely to continue, whether the rest of the market is going to contribute, or whether it's likely these stocks have done their dash for now and the market has turned down. Just a quick reminder, this podcast is general advice only and is not intended to be specific to your personal situation. If you do want to discuss your personal financial situation and how to improve that, you can book a call with me or one of the advice team at nucleuswealth.com forward slash contact. Today, as always, we have Nucleus Wealth's Chief Investment Officer and Co-Founder, Damien Klassen. Welcome. Hey, Sam. How are you going? Good, thanks. My name's Sam Kerr. I'm the Senior Financial Advisor at Nucleus Wealth. We are live every Thursday at 12.30 Australian Eastern Standard Time. So jump onto the Nucleus Wealth YouTube channel and you can ask any questions that come to mind and we'll do our best to answer them during the show. We are also available on all major podcast platforms, so you can listen there if you prefer. And uh, just want to let the viewers know we are currently offering a free no obligation super review at the moment. We'll give your super a health check. Uh, we'll give you clarity on how you're invested, the fees that you're paying, and the tax savings strategies on offer. Uh, so you can book in via nucleuswealth.com forward slash contact. So that's all the housekeeping out of the way. Demo, over to you to get us started. Right. So, yeah, so we wanted to drill a bit into um, the Magnificent Seven, as, as they're being called. Um, the uh, I've got a chart uh, I'll get popped up just sort of showing that the big sort of internet platforms are, are up about 80-odd percent so far this year in terms of their, their um, share price performance versus, you know, if you look at, say, a, a US equal weight index, um, <clears throat> the average stock is down over that same period. So, so uh, these stocks make up a huge proportion of the uh, the US market and the world market, and so uh, they have a an outsized effect, I guess, in terms of the the, the um, giving an impression whether the markets are actually going well or, or actually just a quite a narrow subset of stocks that, that's really sort of driving it. And so we want to sort of drill into into the stocks. Um, we're, we've got um, a number of them. We're overweight couple and and sort of you know just i guess look behind the thoughts behind what we're saying because some of them um uh we're seeing some quite solid earnings growth as well out of these stocks this is probably one of the only areas in where we've what that's meant is that um uh the fundamentals might not look as bad within that sector as 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 um as, as others so anyway I'll, I'll sort of jump to a chart now i've, I've actually this is this was this is one I ran for uh, for a, a, a blog post last month, and I, I've shown it on here, which is just sort of looking at forecast growth. And I actually only used six um, six of the six of the magnificent seven. So, um, oh, sorry, just to, and just to, to to run through them, we're looking at um, so Amazon, uh, Alphabet, which is Google, Meta, which is Facebook, um, Tesla. Uh, what else have we got there? Nvidia, um, Nvidia, Amazon, Amazon, and there's one more I must have forgotten, which I'll, I'm sure I'm sure we'll get to. I, um, I rattled them off at the in the intro, so in the intro, uh, yeah, we're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, this so the, the, this six actually excludes Tesla because Tesla uh, actually some of their earnings doesn't look as as, as strong. Uh, they're actually sort of especially in fourth quarter earnings are falling back a little bit from from quite a strong one last year. But anyway, so if we look at uh, the third quarter earnings. Basically, if you take the top sort of five hundred odd stocks in the in the world and look at what uh, what's what's happening to earnings growth, so earnings growth for the third quarter is forecast to go backwards a little bit. Um, and when we look at how far it's going backwards, um, you know, point point two of percent. But it, but basically, if um, if you only had those big six tech, uh, they're actually adding um, almost four percent growth to the growth figures. And then every other company in the world is is basically detracting all that that four percent and leaving you back, um, or more than that, 
four percent and leaving it back at um, below zero in terms of the and that's what's expected for this um, the quarter that's just finished but hasn't been reported yet. Then if you go to the uh, the fourth quarter, so so the one we've just literally uh, started um, fourth calendar quarter, so the big that big six is going to add. Um, 5.6% growth to the uh, to, to, to sort of the, the world. And then all the other stocks combined is basically going to add a little bit and take away a little bit and, and you end up with 5% growth. So it's all, all the growth for the fourth quarter is coming from the, the, those big six stocks. And then finally, um, uh, just looking at 2024, it's a bit of a different story in 2024. So that's the one where um, the uh, the big six is going to add um, you know two point three percent growth, and when I say two point three percent growth, it's not two point three percent growth for those stocks. Those stocks are growing at sort of ten to fifteen percent um, in terms of earnings or, or or better. What it is is you know when when you look at them as a a proportion of the world, that's how much they're sort of contributing to the to the whole world's EPS growth. And so um, we've got sort of question marks about whether the uh, the hundred, whether the ten percent growth that's sort of forecast for twenty twenty four is 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 attainable, and that's been sort of falling back uh, over the last little bit. But um, uh, yeah, where we see the most risk, I guess, is is outside that um, uh, that those big six um, uh, stocks because you know they actually they're the ones with the with the uh, I guess some quite solid fundamentals and and some forces moving in their direction that's sort of probably going to keep driving growth um, into twenty twenty four. Um, uh, you know, even if there was a recession, um, s some of those stocks will probably hold up a little bit better just because the, the uh, you know, the tide's still rising in, in some of the sectors. But it, but anyway, I might um, flick to flick to you through a quick message, Sam, and then we'll jump into the actual stocks and, and, and what we're seeing within each of them. We'll be back with the investment insights very shortly. Nucleus Wealth is an active and passive investment manager. If you like what you're hearing and want some help with the investing, we can do it for you via our active portfolios. Our tactical and core portfolios use the insights shared in this podcast to construct and manage your investment. We blend tactical portfolios to offer our combinations of international shares, Australian shares, government bonds and cash. We vary the asset allocation with the goal of protecting your capital in times of market uncertainty. We also have active international and Australian share portfolios. These are chosen using our quality and value investment philosophy. You can find out more at nucleuswealth.com. Now back to the show. Right. So um, I'll start, I'm going to start with Meta. Uh, now, Meta is one which we have been um, you know, a fair bit overweight in a lot of our portfolios. Uh, it, it had a pretty decent price fall uh, sort of about two years ago and then has, um, has sort of really uh, come back since then. Now, Meta is very much uh, two sort of separate entities that are, that are sort of encouraging people to, to to sort of really you know think about how it sort of fits together. It's it's one is is an advertising company uh, with lots of different um, uh, lots of different uh, sites. Yeah, you know, the main one being Facebook, but also Instagram and and, and, and you know uh, lots of other sort of uh, attached uh, sites to those. So they're uh, a very profitable business. Uh, it does sort of, you know, 100 and, I don't know, 120, 140 billion in, in sales. Um, you know, their costs are, are, are much, much lower. Um, and so, uh, you know, they make a, and, and basically makes all, all of the, um, all of the meta revenue sort of comes from that area. Uh, and it makes pretty good margins within that. You know the costs aren't particularly high, and so uh, within that sector, the you know, well over thirty percent margins um, you typically get. The issue is uh, then they have this Reality Labs, and that's losing about 15, 15 billion um, US dollars a year. And this is the part where um, you know the, the metaverse and, and basically what they're trying to do is um, uh, they've got a whole bunch of programmers working on virtual reality type type um, systems and and. I guess what their their take is that, um, or I guess that the reason behind this is 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 the thought that yeah people went from um, the old phones where they're sort of the non smartphones and then they moved into smartphones and 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 as they did so then all these social media things picked up and then you got um, better internet connections and then a lot of video really took off and and so uh, and and their take is that as as connections get better and and as processing power gets better then then the next step is is virtual reality 
um, type type things. And so, whether it be uh, glasses that sort of give heads up displays and 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 other things like that. Um, the issue is uh, they're losing a lot of money on this, and so that you know they, they've got revenues of um, you know a couple of hundred million uh, a quarter versus costs of um, you know three or four billion per, per quarter. So it's just um, it is very much a sort of a, a long shot, and and they're and they're pouring a lot of money into this. So um, it, will it be sort of uh, prescient and, and and could it be the next big thing? Yeah, look, maybe. Um, uh, it certainly doesn't look like there's there's going to be masses of revenue coming in anytime in the next year and and possibly quite possibly the year after that. Like there's not a, there's not really a great vision of of how this is going to turn into um, to something big. It's really sort of trying to be the first mover and 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 get sort of a a um, foothold in that so that when it does come that they'll be the um the, they'll be the the dominant player in in that market. So um, I guess where I guess where I'm coming to from this is, you know, the, the idea that you want to split it into two really says, okay, well, I should be valuing this company as an advertising company that's making um, and, and ignore the fifteen billion dollars worth of losses from from the uh, Reality Labs and say, well, how much is that advertising company's worth, and then separately value that um, Reality Labs, and if you do it that way, um, you sort of you the, it still looks very cheap. Um, so you're sort of trading on, on um, you know, PE multiples of of sort of you know if you go out a year or two, it's it's well less than twenty, so well less than the average PE. It's it's um, gets down to sort of under sixteen in in the sort of second twelve months. Uh, even on a price to cash flow, you know, it's still in the in the twenties, but it's it's certainly you know pretty close to a market. Um, what what you're trading at for the market on that one. And that's just based on current numbers and current forecasts. If you cut out the um, Reality Labs, you'd knock off another thirty percent off these numbers. So you know that puts it on PEs of closer to ten in, in the second twelve months, um, or, or you know current PEs of sort of fifteen times. And that that's the type of um, multiple you'd pay for sort of a more boring you know um, stayed business. And so if you do that, and then you said, hey, this Reality Labs thing, I'm going to call it worth nothing. Um, you know, the, the stock looks quite cheap. The flip side is, you know, maybe maybe Zuckerberg will keep spending money on this and keep pouring money into um, uh, Reality Labs and, and the whole thing will just be a massive sort of weight around their neck for, for a few more years before they shut it down and it might cost them, you know, $100 billion more. Um, so, yeah, so that's sort of the question you, you, you have with Meta is is where it comes from. We've, we're sort of, we take the view that, look, actually there's a fair bit of margin of safety in Meta and we're happy to be, be overweight uh, more generally. Um the other thing to note, and then this sort of flows through into um, uh, to Google as well, is that the internet. The, the, I've got a chart up, just sort of, or a pie chart, just sort of showing the um, advertising spending by by medium, and the internet is now um, well north of sixty percent. Um, so this is a chart from twenty twenty two. So it's it's you know even more has come across to the internet, and so um, for a long time within this sector. There was this rising tide, which was like, well, it doesn't really matter as much what's what's happening economically in the advertising sector because um, more and more money is flowing from TV to the internet, and so um, you know the growth in in actual internet revenue. You know, if it's a hundred billion dollars, and um, and the, the the advertising market's a trillion, and 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 the, the advertising market has a five percent downturn, but it goes from a you know, the, the hundred billion still goes up because, despite the the, the broader out um, downturn, because there's more and more money money coming in. So that was that was the story for sort of twenty odd years. Now the internet is getting so big as as a proportion of advertising spending that um, you'd have to expect that that they're going to be more um, sensitive to to economic conditions. So uh, if we do get recessions, if we do get uh, downturns, uh, both Meta and Google are going to be a lot more. Um, uh, you yeah, a lot more sensitive to that. So, so, and and advertising companies do tend to be have quite cyclical earnings. So, if when you do go into downturns, one of the first things um, that gets pulled is advertising budgets because they're very easy to 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 to, to stop. Uh, and then you know the companies will work through some of their longer term contracts, and then finally getting to employees or, or things like that that they want to make cuts on. But yeah, advertising is typically one of the first, and so it tends to be very cyclical. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, so that's sort of your, your overlying, overlying risk with, with Meta, but, um, on the flip side, you know, it, it is a, um, uh, it does have some, 
uh, some, some some decent margin of safety in there. If, if you make the assumption that um, uh, Reality Labs is not a not a forever, you know, a millstone around their neck, it's it's either going to um, you know come good at some point and it's worth worth something, or or they'll they'll shut it down and um, and that negative will go away and and the company will you know could, could increase its earnings by thirty percent just by just by shutting down that division uh, tomorrow. Uh, so that sort of leads leads into Alphabet or, or Google. Um, so Google's sort of a bit of a mainstay in, in our portfolios. It's uh, it's 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 not that expensive. Like on it's it's sort of trading roughly on a market multiple. So you know, I guess you your upside downside for 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 Alphabet basically goes well. It's a very high quality stock. So if I can buy it at a market multiple, that's that's yeah, you know, not a bad not a bad start. Um, it's also um, it is quite sensitive as well. So if you do go into economic downturn, then then the, some of those earnings numbers might be at risk. Uh, the flip side is there's they've got lots of AI upside and they've lots of um, uh, they're, they're very much involved in in a lot of the key parts, whether it be uh, data centers, um, AI, sort of the shift online. Um, you know, they they're, they're they make up a whole bunch of the the uh, the parts of the ecosystem, and so it's um, you know to pay for a to pay to, to buy a high quality stock at at slight only slightly more um, expensive than than, than market for, for me is usually a a good sign. So it's another one where we're quite overweight within our portfolio, albeit we we recognise some of the the risks from um, you know from, from cyclicality in that. One we think is um, a little bit more at risk um, is Apple. So, uh, you know, Apple's you know, very high quality earnings. It's a fair bit more expensive though. Um, we've sort of got it, um, you know, in the in the eighty fourth percentile of, of value. It's so so basically, um, you know, in the in in the bottom sort of sixteen percent of, of of stocks. So. Um, you, you do have to pay up for it. There are a number of sort of risks that are, that are bouncing around for it. Uh, one is um, we've obviously got a decent amount of political tension between the US and China and the US putting a lot of uh, restrictions upon uh, what technologies can be sent to China. Apple is reliant on China for not only manufacturing, but also for uh, its um, a, a fair chunk of its sales. And it's one of the few companies of this ones of the ones we're going to talk about that actually does have a um, uh, that does actually sell into China, and so there is some risk of uh, anti-American sentiment and, and and crackdowns on you know government departments not buying Apple products and, and things like that within uh, within China that may lead to um, uh, to some you know some risk on that side. Plus, China's uh, having a fair fair bit of struggles in terms of its growth as well. And so, uh, you know, that that's, that was a bit of a growth engine was was the Chinese consumer buying a lot of Apple products. And so there's sort of risk on, on two fronts from that, economic risks and also political risks. So for us, uh, you know, at these levels, it's not a stock, you know, we're, we're, we have it within our portfolio because it's such a, a large part of the index, but we're, but we're underweight the, um, this, this as, a, uh, as a holding. So, and a lot of that stock is a stock we sort of, you know, for a lot of clients, um, bought it at, at, at very cheap levels. And, and it's sort of one of those stocks, you know, I guess the, the way we think about our portfolios is drifting in and, and quali between quality and value. When we find high quality stocks like Apple and, and they get back to be sort of average price, then we're happy to buy them and, and sort of leave them in our portfolios for, for a while. And then when they get expensive, we might, um, you know, sell down a little bit, but but not all of it and um, uh, you know, go back a little bit more underweight and that's sort of the position we're in at the moment is is underweight in terms of the uh in terms of the holdings uh another you know one of the other big sort of hype uh areas of the market is is, is obviously nvidia which we've, we've spoken about a few times on on this podcast but it's worth just a recapping some of the thoughts behind it because uh the earnings growth looks spectacular mm -hmm. um it's uh you know this is a stock that sort of went from you know, a couple hundred billion to, to well over a trillion in the last year. Um, it's had a a remarkable turnaround. They uh, th there's some really hefty forecasts that are starting to come through now. So uh, one of them I just wanted to highlight. We've got a I've got a chart up of, of private investment in in artificial intelligence. Um, 
and this is global. Um, so in 2022, it was um, 91 billion. And uh, I th the latest forecast I've seen is that NVIDIA's forecast to do 90 something, I think maybe 95 billion by, by 2025. So, um, you know, that 91 billion is, is the total sum of all salaries paid, all the, the computing power, all, you know, everything that's gone into it is, is in that figure. And basically, um, uh, the expectations are now that that uh, one company that's that's admittedly not even a, a, a not actually do, even doing the artificial intelligence, just providing sort of um, hardware services to to them, is going to do the same amount as a total market combined. So um, it might happen, it might happen, but there is some really aggressive forecasting that's that's going into the the, the numbers. It, it looks like. Um, you know, NVIDIA will just make up, you know, you'll need, you, not only do you need the entire sort of capital expenditure, oh, sorry, another, yeah, another way to look at it is um, if the entire capital expenditure of all the companies um, who are doing cloud computing um, doubled over the next um, uh, three years, then um, NVIDIA would have to have almost 100% market share of, of, all, um, of all technology that's going into them. Regardless of the fact that NVIDIA, you know, when you when you put a PC in uh, or, or a server in, sorry, um, you don't just need the, uh, the the GPU chip that they're selling to to do this. You actually also need you know power and you need memory and you need you know hard disks and all that other stuff that goes into it um, is sort of you know is factored into that. So there's there's some great growth into it, um, but you know at current share price, you basically need to get um, uh, yeah, it, it it basically needs to to give us some of the greatest growth ever seen, and I I, I don't have any problems with with some of the near term forecasts about saying yes, um, they can sort of double and and triple their 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 uh, revenues from where they were last year. I don't have any problems with that. It's the problem of when you start getting two or three years out and and you're like, okay, now, you know, it's one thing to grow from from ten billion to to twenty billion. Um, but then to say that a company is going to grow from 50 billion to 90 billion in, in a year is um, uh, uh, is just that order of magnitude harder, and especially when the market itself um, has not been that big. <laughs> so um, yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll watch that space. But but it's uh, you know the, it's it's expensive. Um, love to buy it, but on on fundamentals, but um, just can't justify the price. And, and I've got a, sort of a, a twofold chart up. You know, this is the, you know, my example is Cisco. <laughs> now, Cisco was a um, one of the hyped stocks during the internet boom, sort of back in the uh, back in the early '90s. And on the left, we have a chart showing their earnings per share and how uh, you know that's been a, a pretty great performance. So, earnings has been earnings is sort of ten times higher than what it was 25 years ago. It's been this pretty steady line upwards, um, where just year after year, they they just keep getting that earnings growth coming through. Uh, the flip side is that the chart on the right is is showing their share price. And so, if you had bought it at the peak of the hype cycle in in 1999, um, you would have paid like 80 bucks for it, and it's sort of currently 53 dollars. So you, you, you're still down 30 something percent on 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 what you would have bought that. So it, it just sort of comes back to that. And, and Cisco's one is the stock that we own, you know. So, so that's one that's in our portfolio, but we didn't buy it at, at you know, I wouldn't have been out there buying it at eighty dollars, but certainly more than happy to own it at, at sort of um, at current levels. And so, but what I'm, I guess, where I'm getting to is, um, yeah, price is very important. You can have a stock that's great and 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 fundamentally supplies. And and I think the other real parallel with with um, Cisco is, you know, Cisco provides a service to the internet that's very important and 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 you know is. Is critical to the functioning of, of the internet, but it doesn't mean they get to take all the value from the, from all the internet and 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 you know accrue these unbelievable profits. They're, they're really in the end just a service provider to it, and and I look very much at um at, at Nvidia in the same way. They don't have, yes, they've got some some of the best and the fastest chips out there, and they're, they're you know very useful in terms of um, how they're going to be uh, you're providing services to that to that industry, but it doesn't mean they get to take all the profits from from the artificial intelligence boom. Next, we have Amazon. So uh, Amazon is a uh, is again, you know, 
I'd split it into three different companies, the way I look at it. So similar to, to what I was saying in, in, in how you should be looking at um, uh, Meta by splitting it into that two parts. Uh, Amazon, you really need to look at it in three three parts. Now, the key part of Amazon is is probably the least well known for um, for ordinary consumers, but it's the what's called AWS, Amazon Web Servers, and they're they're basically the uh, the market leader in cloud computing. So they're about a third of a uh, third of market share. Um, the, the next twenty two percent, the Azure, that's that's Microsoft, and then Google um, gives you the next 10, uh, 11 percent. And then sort of rats and mice um, down from there, but you know the idea is that uh, Amazon is is an excellent um, top tier provider within this um, within this market. And when you look at Amazon's earnings, um, and what we're looking at is their uh, basically their operating earnings relative to the sales. Uh, they do like thirty percent margins, that, or you know they were doing up to last year. They've fallen back a bit the margins now, um, but you know. 20 to 30 percent margins they do in in Amazon Web Services and growing um, quickly, um, and and all the other businesses you know sort of range between a very low margin of you know one or two percent and, and and losses within that. And so when I think about this, um, you know, so so um, is it when I say there's three businesses within it, I think about Amazon Web Services as being um, you know the, the real key part to Amazon. Then you have this Amazon US, and um, which is a you know again a, a, a behemoth within its sector, but it really doesn't make much money. So it does sort of three hundred billion worth of revenue. So the revenues are great, um, and its margins sort of range between minus one percent to plus three percent. So what that means is you know three percent margins, you're doing um, uh, you know nine or ten billion dollars worth of uh, worth of profits. Um, but you know the the profits sort of will will vary up and down, uh, but it, but a nice business, you know, a dominant player in the sector, um, you know, by far and head and shoulders above um, all their competitors, and and so you know a, a solid business within that. The rest of the world loses money for Amazon, and it has consistently lost money for Amazon for um, you know basically ever since ever since they started, and so. Again, it's sort of a measure of breaking this up and, and looking at sort of forecasts for, for earnings and saying, well, if earnings, of, you know, the current share price of Amazon is sort of, um, you know, 120 something dollars. Uh, the uh, you've got uh, about two dollars. So in terms of future earnings, there's about two dollars fifty of earnings from AWS that, that's growing, you know, at 10, 15 percent per annum in terms of um, multiples and, and margins have come back a bit and, and potentially will expand again. So you know there's, there's a there's a reason to want to pay up for that. But um, even if you put that on a multiple of sort of forty times, that is say okay, that's worth a hundred dollars of the, the hundred and twenty odd dollars. Um, then you take the the Amazon US, which is doing about a dollar per share of, of of earnings, and and say you stuck that on a roughly a market multiple of, of twenty times. You know that that, and then he said the um, the rest of the world's worth nothing. That sort of basically gives you the current share price. So, um, and you and you are paying up for for AWS. So, you know, there's not a lot of margin for safety is where I'm getting to within this. It's it's probably not, it's it's not horrendously expensive, um, but you know, there's there's levels where um, you would be much keener to buy this uh, than, than 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 current levels. You know, you have to be pretty aggressive in terms of what your your your, your growth forecasts are for AWS, um, and and they might you know that that they might come through, but um, it's it also is, is a little bit of a uh, 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 it's a little bit of a paradox in some ways about saying well if I'm if I'm forecasting that that Nvidia is going to grow this market and they're going to take all the profits from 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 AI then then there's there's actually not that much left over for AWS to get. So you know you you've sort of got to if if you if you're imagining a world where both Nvidia and AWS and Google and Microsoft all make lots of money from AI, then the AI then that AI um, size that AI market has to be, um, you know, I don't know, ten times bigger than what it is currently. So um, yeah, it's it's a uh, again a question of where do you want to buy it. So for us. We're we're quite keen. Uh, we we love the Amazon AWS business. We sort of um, don't mind the Amazon US business, um, and, and could certainly happy to leave the the, the rest of the world. But um, at current multiples, that's sort of not one that sort of sits on our um, 
it sits on our our wish list, but uh, you know the the we've got sort of certain levels that we want to buy it at, and they're, and they're lower than where where we are today. Um, I won't go heaps into Microsoft, just sort of um, you know cognizant of time. Uh, Microsoft is is similar to Google uh, in the way that it sits across a whole bunch of these different areas that are all seem to be ticking along. Um, it's, it's earnings growth is great. It's not hugely expensive. Um, it's a little bit expensive, not hugely so. Uh, it's it's in the middle of AI. It's got lots in terms of data centers. They're um, cloud computing. They've got security, uh, cyber security. They've got gaming. You know, a whole bunch of different areas. None of those are particularly going to move the needle massively because they're all sort of part of this this behemoth. But there's a lot of sort of um, there's a lot of parts moving in the right direction, and uh, and and not massively expensive. And and those earnings just keep keep ticking up, um, you know, year after year. Uh, and then last of all, Tesla. So Tesla is, you know, I've always struggled with this one. And I think we're starting to see some of the uh, impacts of, of, of why I've sort of struggled to want to, to wanna buy it. So it is expensive. Um, it's always been expensive. You know, on a, on a price, it's, probably, it's, it's much less expensive today than what it's been in, in the past. But, um, you know, you're still paying 60 times next year's earnings, um, you know, uh, more than a hundred times the, the 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 price to cash flow. The issues are that uh, yeah, several within this. One is that there was there was a view amongst um, I guess the the bulls that Tesla would be the the biggest um, they would end up being the biggest car manufacturer in the world. So that's um, and by, by a relatively significant margin, and they would have. Um, the highest margins in the world. So, so most other car make, manufacturers actually make pretty pretty poor margins. They they don't make a lot in the way of profits. Um, whereas Tesla was making um, has been making much larger margins than others. The issue is when you're doing um, when you have cars that are that are that are greatly in demand and you haven't been able to meet your um, uh, targets in terms of things that. So you, your demand's greater than your supply. Um, you, means you get to charge a premium on, the, on those cars, and they've been making you know these 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 great profits. As they they get as they want to expand, though, um, you know, not everyone can afford an eighty thousand or a hundred thousand dollar car, and, and a lot of people are, are more than happy to be buying twenty and thirty thousand dollar cars. Um, that's the market that that uh, Chinese EVs are really starting to push into. And we're, we're, we've seen a lot of price wars within China as already in the last um, in the last couple of months. So that's where the risk is: is that can they ever expand into the lower market if they don't really um, uh, be a lot more aggressive on the pricing? And if they are more aggressive on the pricing, then that means the margins that they currently have go away, and so you end up with this um, you know, uh, again that sort of um, paradox in terms of. It's, it's hard to see how you can get both the earning, both the growth and keep the market share and keep the margins really high. It feels like one of those has to give. And if one of those has to give, um, the stock does look expensive. And the other big sort of, um, the other major risk for, for Tesla is, is the self-driving cars. So um, Tesla doesn't have very good self-driving cars. They've got excellent um, driver assist. So if you are, so, so relative to other companies, in terms of the, um, uh, the, the the technologies you have to, to for lane changes and self parking and 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 cruise control and all those things like that, yeah, Tesla is is head and shoulders, um, or, or certainly well in front of, of its competitors um, on that front. What, where they're not in front and where they quite lag quite behind is the fully autonomous driving, and so we're seeing already um, Cruise and 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 Waymo. So Cruise is, is from General Motors and, and Waymo is the Google. Um, uh, offshoot have already moved into uh, live production in San Francisco and, and are looking at other cities. And um, the the issue there is that okay, Tesla's a fair way behind. Um, if the, the the bigger issue though is uh, you know regardless of whether they can catch up and 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 start putting these out under their own name or or whether they just do a deal with one of these other companies to 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 put their to put these other company systems in in Teslas. The bigger issue is um, will people continue to buy their own car when they're self-driving because 
if you make the assumption, which I think most sort of um, sort of futurists do, is that people will certainly limit the number of cars they buy and and not have that second car, or or um, or and, and in many cases not have that first car, uh, because you can use the self driving cars to, to to get you wherever you want to go, and that those self driving cars, because you cut the um, the driver out, which is 60 70 percent of the cost is that you know it'll be ubers at at a at a 70 percent discount if that's the case then um uh you just don't need as many cars like most cars people buy they will sit there and they'll drive um you know this is certainly the second cars is is sort of ten thousand kilometers a year and on a global basis even if you look at you know all if you look at all cars you 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 know sometimes you're getting down to that those levels in some of the more developed countries so, um, and if that's the case, and you're looking at, at a car's driving, say, ten to fifteen thousand kilometers a year, versus a a taxi that's going to drive, uh, maybe not ten times that, but certainly um, certainly six or seven times that, is that it means that for every for every taxi, if you assume that people are still doing roughly the same amount of travel, for every car that's for every taxi that you put on, you can take um, you know six or seven cars off the road, or and not even yeah, not even have to buy those. And so that would mean um, some tr- dramatic falls in terms of the, the amount of production, uh, car production that you have. And then the, the, the extra step on top of that is that um, I, for one, uh, couldn't care less what brand of car um, my Uber driver is driving. And, and I think what you'll find is people will be the same for their um, uh, for self-driving cars if it's, if it's a self-driving taxi. Is that, yes, you, you might care if you're buying a car for yourself, what, what the brand is, but um, if it's somebody else's in a taxi, it's like couldn't care as long as the thing as long as it's going to get me from A to B, um, you know, it's whatever it is. And so that's where um, uh, you know I, I struggle to you know, running the scenarios on Tesla. Yeah, I can I can certainly run certain scenarios that end up saying yeah, this thing's worth a lot of money, but they're um, and worth more than the current share price. But they 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 seem to have some pretty extreme um, examples in there, and they rely on self-driving cars basically failing and everyone or at least everyone is still buying a self-driving car and that tesla manages to keep margins really high despite um uh despite sort of going mass market i'll go back to you seb we'll be back again shortly if you like what you're hearing but want a low-cost passive option nucleus wealth is the first to offer passive direct indexing in australia the first generation of passive investing was index funds the next gen was etfs Now, direct indexing is here with significantly more customization and control. The benefit of direct indexing is you can add or subtract investment themes, and we have almost 100 different options to choose from. For example, you could buy an international share direct index portfolio that excludes fossil fuels and arms manufacturers and has a tilt towards cybersecurity and cloud computing. Alternatively, you could buy a portfolio with no screens and an extra exposure to nuclear power and defense contractors. You can find out more at nucleuswealth.com. Now back to the show. Now we have our question of the week. So this is for viewers to have some discussion in the comment section over the coming days. So the question for this week is, will this tech boom continue or has it peaked? So feel free to post your thoughts and engage with us and some of the other viewers over the coming days. Just want to give a quick shout out to Richard Dobos. I uh, hope I pronounce your surname correctly. Uh, Richard's a regular viewer and commenter, so just want to uh, say thanks for your support and um, yeah, keep it up. Uh, yeah, so Debo, back to you for the investment implications. Yeah, so um, I want to deal with some of the macro thoughts behind this. So, sort of, I mean, the whole thing's been a, a bit of an investment implications on the individual stocks, but but as a macro call, um, there's because we've had such strong earnings growth within this sector and probably going to um, see some some reasonably strong um, earnings growth still relative to other companies within that sector, um, my preference is is to go for the stocks that, that have got more exposure to the AI, more exposure to um, the cloud computing, because that's one area where I do see that continual move from, from off, um, off cloud to, to on cloud as, and just companies from who have been sort of spurred into action by the pandemic and and that's that's just an ongoing um you know lift to all those guys so that's microsoft uh amazon um google are all sort of heavily exposed in those ones um 
I do have some sort of issues with with some of the if, if we are going to recession like we're expecting uh, some of the more cyclical companies. So uh, you know Amazon on it, on its retail side is, is, is faces some pressures there, but but you know that's offset by its by its other divisions. Um, Google in particular um, and and Meta uh, face some issues there, but uh, we think there's some other there's there's enough mitigating um, other areas of the business that that are, that are worth offsetting. Uh, and then Apple, where that's less so that, you know, if we do, do go into downturn and more issues with China, so so less likely to Apple and, and then um, yeah, not at all in in um, in Tesla. So, um, so that's sort of the broad economic. But but the other thing to keep in mind is that the, these investment yields. So we are looking at um, some some quite uh, significant increases in bond yields that we've seen in, in the in the recent weeks. And, and that has put pressure on on in terms of the way you look at these stocks. It is, uh, you know, when when bond yields are sort of, you know, one or two percent, then you look at these long growth companies, uh, long sort of, or companies with a, a a a better long term growth profile, and you can put a higher valuation on them. Now that the higher valuations are sort of stuck around, despite um, the higher bond yields, they have come back a little bit, but but certainly nothing like what we've we've um, we've seen, and and and. You know, more generally, the market does look uh, particularly expensive on that basis. So, I guess the the issue for me is, uh, you know, if you do start going to recession, and you know, or, or certainly if you do see sort of panic selling and 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 sort of significant downturns, these are some of the stocks that will get sold off, largely because they are large parts of the market. They're also very liquid; they're the easier parts to sell. And um, I guess what I'm what I'm doing with, with within my portfolios is looking for that as an opportunity to, to pick these up and, and buy more of them because they do tend to be high quality companies, and it's a, it's a question about putting the the, the the lines in to say okay, at what stage are we are we starting to, to to pile up on these companies and 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 they are generally high companies that you want to sort of grab and, and stick in your bottom drawer and forget about. So um, uh, yeah, for each of the stocks within that, we're sort of trying to track a a figure where we're we're where we're happy to to uh, to get in and start buying more. Excellent. So, Dana, I just want to add as well, uh, as the listeners would have heard, we do have the screens and tilts uh, and a couple of ideas of how to uh, get some extra exposure to these stocks if uh, if the investors want. Uh, we have a tilt called large technology stocks, so you can add them in uh, across all the different portfolios on offer. Uh, we also got a cloud computing tilt and a robotics and artificial intelligence to it. So uh, you can have some extra exposure to all those themes there as well. Uh, so that almost wraps us up for today. So Damo, thanks for uh, sharing your insights and uh, rationale behind you know, the, the Magnificent Seven. And yeah, uh, very interesting. I'm, I'm sure the viewers got lots of uh, value out of today. Thanks, Sam. So we do welcome your feedback on this podcast, especially in regards to suggestions for future topics. If you do have any ideas, please drop it in the comments section below, uh, or you can send us an email at contact at nucleuswealth.com. Also, if you know of anyone that might get some value out of today's episode, we'd really appreciate it if you do share it with them. So from myself, Damien, and the rest of the team at Nucleus Wealth, thanks for watching, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now.